This week on Hometown Ghost Stories, over 13,000 inmates served time at the old Idaho State Penitentiary during its 101 years of operation. 129 of those inmates died within the prison walls, yet some of those deceased prisoners still seem to be serving their sentences from beyond the realm of their earthly existence. Join us as we explore the history and haunting of the old Idaho State Penitentiary. Hometown Ghost Stories contains serious and often distressing events and is not intended for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Old Idaho State Penitentiary, 2014. Emily shuddered as she stepped through the gate into the old prison yard. She looked around at the site, taking in the historic scenery. Most of the buildings in the complex were made from rusticated sandstone in a handsome Romanesque style, but the tour was taking them to the maximum security cell block house 5, Death Row. If she had been asked to describe this building, she would detail a very severe utilitarian structure devoid of grace and style. The tour guide led the small group into the building, and right away, Emily could feel the thickness of the air as it filled her lungs. The guide was explaining the history of the building and how it was used to house the worst of the worst inmates like Raymond Snowden and Douglas Van Vlack. Emily noticed a calendar hanging on the wall of one of the cells, December 1973. The building had been vacant since the prison riot of that year and it remained exactly as it was, as if it were stuck there in time. The cells were small and solitary, each with a sink, bed, and a toilet. The guide explained that the prisoners would spend 23 hours a day locked in those cells, with only one hour to either take a shower or go to the exercise yard. Emily was overcome with a feeling of claustrophobia and turned away from the cell, leaning her back against the bars. The tour guide went on, but Emily zoned out, looking up at the flickering light on the ceiling. Suddenly, her focus was broken and she was pulled from her trance by the sound of somebody gasping behind her. She whirled around to see who made the sound, but was immediately reminded that she had been leaning against the bars of the jail cell and there was nothing behind her except for the empty cell. A chill ran up her spine as she wondered what made the sound, but kept her mouth shut, noting that nobody else seems to have heard it. The tour went on and brought them to the execution chamber. Emily couldn't help but notice the strong feeling of negative energy surrounding her in this building. Others around her also seemed to be feeling it, given the looks on their faces. The tour guide walked up and stood on the trap door to begin telling the story of Raymond Snowden and his botched execution. She didn't get more than two words out when all of a sudden, the door to the stairway slammed out of nowhere. Everyone jumped as the thunderous boom echoed off the walls. Somebody let out a scream, but Emily never saw who it was because at that moment, all the lights in the building simultaneously went out. I'm Dave Wilkins, and this is Hometown Ghost Stories, the old Idaho State Penitentiary, Boise, Idaho. Built in 1870, the old Idaho Penitentiary is one of only four territorial prisons open to the public today. During its 101 years of operation, the site saw escapes, scandals, and the effects of Boise's transition from the Wild West to a mid-20th century capital city. In the late 19th century, the territory of Idaho was still frontier land, and like most territories at the time, many of its settlements were lawless. In order to secure statehood in the Union, Idaho needed a prison, so they built a one-cell house that over time grew into a complex of buildings surrounded by a large sandstone wall. The penitentiary held up to 600 prisoners at one time, and the inmates suffered through almost inhuman conditions. For the first 50 years of its existence, the prison had no plumbing, which led to substandard conditions that spread diseases. This was further complicated by the prison's ill-working ventilation system. 
The sandstone that formed its walls was mined in a nearby quarry by the prisoners and was a plentiful and inexpensive building material, but it also intensified the temperatures inside the cells. In the hot Boise summers, the sandstone retained the heat, creating a stifling oven effect, while in the winter, the walls held the bitter cold, chilling the prisoners for months. These conditions pushed inmates to their limits and guards reacted with extreme violence until 1971 when prisoners reached their breaking point. In 1971 and again in 1973, riots broke out. Prisoners burned the chapel and dining hall to the ground and damaged many other buildings. The 1973 riot was the more severe of the two and shortly thereafter, prisoners were moved to a more modern penitentiary south of Boise. On December 3rd of that year, the penitentiary was closed down. Not long after, it was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. Over the course of the 101 years it was open, the old Idaho penitentiary housed over 13,000 convicts, 129 of which died within its walls. But some of those who died there, it's believed their spirits remain, wandering the old halls of the building that incarcerated their earthly form. There's no way to tell just how many spirits haunt this old prison, but there are three former inmates in particular whose spirits are known to linger. The first is that of a man named Harry Orchard. Orchard was a miner with a Western Mining Union that was targeted by Idaho Governor Frank Stunenberg. The governor incurred the wrath of the Union when he called in federal troops to stamp out labor violence in the North Idaho Mining District in 1899. Uncontrollable miners were herded into bullpens, but Orchard escaped this confinement by hiking over the hills to Montana. He became a vagabond dynamiter, killing mine owners, non-union men, and public officials who opposed the Federation in California, Colorado, and Idaho. He was eventually stopped after he showed up in Caldwell, Idaho at Governor Stunenberg's house and rigged the side gate with dynamite. On December 30th, 1905, Frank Stunenberg walked through the gate triggering the bomb, killing him instantly. Harry Orchard was arrested, convicted, and sentenced to hang, but ended up giving up the names of the leadership members of the labor union who contracted him for the assassinations. His sentence was in turn commuted to life in the Idaho State Penitentiary, where he spent 46 years before passing away at the age of 88. Orchard spent more time in the prison than any other prisoner in the history of the complex, so it's no surprise his spirit lingers behind. What might come as a surprise is that the people who claim to have encountered Orchard's ghost say that it seems to be a friendly spirit, accompanied by feelings of comfort and happiness. This may be because Orchard ended up enjoying his time there. After his sentence was commuted to life, he converted to Christianity and became a model inmate. He was later eligible for parole, but refused to leave the prison. His ghost is known to follow tours around, assisting the guides as they show the property. The Women's Ward, 1962. Helen could see her breath as she lie in her cell. It was almost completely dark except for one flickering light several yards down the hall. The prison was freezing this time of year. The sandstone walls would retain and exacerbate the extreme temperatures of whatever season it was, and it just so happened that it was winter, therefore unbearably cold. In the summer months, the sweltering heat makes the inmates yearn for the winter months, but when they finally do arrive, they're accompanied by the bitter reminder of their unrelenting frigidity. And that's how the time passed at the old Idaho State Pen. Too hot, too cold, too hot, too cold, and so on. Helen climbed out of bed and began pacing, knowing she wouldn't be able to sleep that night. There was something in the air that wasn't just the cold, something dark. She walked to the bars of the cell door and peered down the hall towards the flickering light. Her heart skipped a beat as she found herself looking at a woman standing in the hall beneath the dangling light bulb. She was looking directly at her without making eye contact. Helen had a bad feeling about the woman noticing that something wasn't quite right. But before she had a chance to identify exactly what that was, she was gone, disappeared into the darkness, and Helen was left with her thoughts in the bitter cold. Another ghost that haunts the old prison is that of Lida Southard, 
Twin Falls' first female serial killer. Between 1915 and 1920, she killed four of her husbands, a brother-in-law, and possibly her two-year-old daughter. Lida killed by boiling arsenic out of flypaper, then lacing her victim's food with the poison. She was convicted in 1921 of poisoning her fourth husband, Edward Meyer, and was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment in the Idaho Penitentiary. In 1931, she escaped from the prison and fled to Denver, where she immediately married another man, but was recaptured before she presumably was able to kill him too. Lida stayed in prison until 1941, but was pardoned in 1942. Once she got out of prison, she got married for the seventh time to another man whom she did not kill and died of a heart attack in 1958. Despite not having died at the prison, her ghost is believed to haunt the women's ward. Paranormal investigators have found that their equipment will go dead or malfunction in this area, and orbs have been caught on camera. A full-bodied female apparition has been spotted by various visitors and staff. Some believe it to be a female spirit named Cora, while others speculate it may be the ghost of Lyda Southard. The most notorious inmate ever to walk the halls of the old Idaho State Penitentiary was a man nicknamed Idaho's Jack the Ripper. 4,700 miles away from the site of the original Jack the Ripper murders, and 68 years later, 27-year-old Raymond Allen Snowden walked into the Hi-Ho Club in Garden City, Idaho. It was there where he met a woman named Cora Dean. Cora Dean was so depressed by the death of her husband that to take her mind off her sadness, she used to drive into downtown Garden City, Idaho to drink and play the gambling machines on Saturday nights. The two met and spent the night dancing and drinking before agreeing to go back to Snowden's residence in Boise, but the couple never made it back to the city. In fact, they never made it out of the parking lot. They began arguing over who was going to pay the cab fare for the taxi back into Boise. The argument got physical with Snowden slapping Cora. She in turn kicked Snowden in the groin. Enraged, he pulled out a pocket knife and proceeded to stab Cora 29 times before mutilating her body and fleeing the scene. When her body was found the next day, a pathologist determined that her throat had been slashed and then the killer pushed his blade into the base of her skull to probe for the spinal cord. As soon as he found it, another quick slash severed it. She died at the age of 48. Upon murdering Dean, Snowden took her wallet and hitched a ride with a passing motorist to Boise. Luckily, detectives were on to Snowden due to eyewitnesses spotting him leave with Dean. Detective Frank Bohr of the Garden City Police remembered locking up a man for a night some years previously because he had threatened to cut his girlfriend's spinal cord. Acting on a hunch, Bohr arrested the man, Raymond Snowden, and witnesses came forward to establish that Snowden was the last man seen talking to Cora in a downtown bar. Snowden was convicted and sentenced to hang at the old Idaho Penitentiary on October 18, 1957. His execution took place inside the Idaho State Penitentiary, and before his hanging, he confessed to killing two other women. However, the execution didn't go as planned. When the trapdoor below Snowden opened, the fall didn't immediately snap his neck. Instead, Snowden struggled to breathe for approximately 15 minutes while the Dean family watched. Some speculate that this was not in fact an accident, that the guards planned for it to go down exactly the way it did. Snowden was buried in an unmarked grave in the graveyard of the Idaho State Penitentiary. He lies in his grave with at least 55 others who were buried on the property. Cell Block House 5, or nicknamed Five House, where Snowden was executed, is said to be the most haunted and most active of all the rooms in the prison. People who have visited the prison claim they heard the sounds of a man struggling to breathe. The majority of the prisoners, visitors, and guards have reported a feeling of dread and oppression in certain areas. Many believe this to be paranormal activity, and is the spirit of Snowden reliving his prolonged death. Over 13,000 inmates were incarcerated over the course of the 101 years the prison was active. Some served short sentences, some served long sentences, some served life sentences, and some served death sentences. But there is no question that out of those who served at the old Idaho State Penitentiary, 
Some are still serving their sentences in the afterlife. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome into Hometown Ghost Stories, episode number 94. We're going to Idaho, and I got to tell you, I recorded intros, I typed out things, I made the thumbnail, I did all of this stuff, and I could not stop calling this place Ohio. It is not Ohio, and I'm not going to make that mistake once today. That's the promise I have for you folks, and I promise Rob is here. Hi, Rob. It's kind of interesting that you refer to it as another state when we're covering literally the only building that's ever been built in a, in Idaho. So um, hard to mistake that. No, they build a lot of buildings, but most of them are built out of potatoes. Speaking of potatoes, we're also joined by Dave. Hello, Dave. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. Thank you for that intro. <laughs> it's one for the ages. It's one for the ages. But uh, no, this place is, is awesome. We actually got... Um, I believe it was Chris who was in chat. He says that he's been, yeah, Chris Valentino in chat says, uh, says that he's been there. It's says very creepy place. You can look in much of the buildings. I watched a bunch of the tours on YouTube today and the tours look like they're awesome. They're open to paranormal investigations. And a, a lot of the heavy hitter shows have been there and found a ton of evidence. And there are some bad, bad people that have passed through here and been executed here. And in prison? Yeah, it's wild, right? Uh, My dog has shocking. found the most firm toy to play with, and I must take it away from her. It even changed the lights in my background. But what's up to everyone who's hanging on live chat? We have a lot of folks here. Uh, we got a nineteen uh, $19.99 donation from Anna C. So thank you so much. Rare, A rare IPA you've never heard of donated $2. Thank you so much for that. And then we got 10 gifted memberships, I believe, from Jeannie, was it? Yeah, Janine. Yeah, so thank you so much. We appreciate all of you for all the donations and, of course, for spending your Tuesday evenings with us here on Hometown Ghost Stories. So That's Idaho, right. is this our first time covering Idaho? This is it our is. first time covering Idaho, and this is a pretty good location, I thought, because I wanted to find something in Idaho because we haven't covered that state yet. And the first thing I found was this Idaho State Penitentiary. And so you're lazy and you don't look for more than the first thing you find is what you're telling everybody. Well, if I find something good, I don't keep looking. I say, okay. all right, I found something good. And then I just cover that. Mm -hmm. So next time we cover. This Idaho. is why so, you're married and why I'm single. Yes. <laughs> 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 we Next time we cover Idaho, we can actually go back and cover Boise because there are a ton of other haunted locations in Boise. But there was just so much at this location that we I just isolated this one location so that we can so that we can uh, go over yeah. this in, in depth because I covered three of the hauntings that are at this prison and that doesn't even scratch the surface of like the haunts that go on at this place. There are so many haunted different parts of this prison are haunted, some more than others, but we can get into all that because this place is just chock full of scary hauntings. We One thing I good for you for settling on a good location. Rob's going to be that guy at a bar in 30 years sitting there by himself talking about the one that got away, but he's talking about a haunted location that he passed over because <laughs> he looked for other ones. It was this one. I had this one on the back burner at some point. I was going to do this and I passed it up to do something else. And I'm like, ah, Dave, he took my my Idaho State Penitentiary. It's Ohio. Sorry. Okay. All right. Shout out to Demon King becoming a member for four months. Welcome back, Demon King. We have missed you. We actually talked about you last stream for a while while there was a battle of the ages going on in chat donations. But <laughs> that's not the only reason we want you here. We love you. And thanks for coming by again. Absolute legend. Um, a lot of people are talking about they were they were all expecting Al Capone to be mentioned in this episode. <laughs> Al Capone didn't serve time there, but I was I was hoping also that he would pop up because, you know. He usually does. That's but, usually the but, case. And speaking of usually popping up, Demon King donating $6.66 in a super chat. And uh, he says, hope everyone is having an awesome Tuesday night. Thank you so much, Demon King. And, um, and, and welcome into the live stream. It's always good to have you here, my friend. Indeed. So I noticed uh, Serena in chat earlier said, if I see 
anything about a woman in a white dress or a female ghost in this, I'm going to lose my mind. And I assume she was saying that because this is a prison and prisons are mostly male dominated, but there, there was a female ghost here and she is the serial killer. But random fact about Idaho, Idaho leads the country for female incarceration. This state prison had something like 200 women incarcerated there, over 200 incarcerated there in the just the hundred years that it was in service. And for that area and that time period, that is a pretty large amount. So I don't know what it is with Idaho and the women out there, but um, it's 110 per every 100,000, which is literally more than one woman for every thousand women that live in Idaho are in prison. <laughs> Which is interesting. I would assume it's so all. I would assume it's all potato thieves. It's got to be. It's got to be. We should have, we should have started a potato joke counter for Jesse at the beginning of this episode <laughs> to see how many that he actually comes up with for this. Because so you're you saying we don't have to start it yet because none of them have been good. So <laughs> <laughs> they've both been home runs. Is it because I called you a potato? Is that, is yeah. that is that why? Yeah, that's why. Anyways, I, got um, got I am disappointed that I I'm disappointed that I deleted our Jack the Ripper. Uh, transition oh, screen because I was no. like, oh, we never need this one again. And uh, wrong, and here we are sort of talking about Jack the Ripper, but it's right, the Jesse, Jack the Ripper. Let's just do this. I want you to look directly in the camera. Hang on, right? I, we could do one better. We could do one better. We can get it back. It's not. It's not gone. Gone. It's not gone. Gone. No. Oh, okay. We can, we can always. Why don't, get just, why don't you just get it ready for when we talk about that portion of the haunting? Uh, why don't we just? Here. Why don't we just say Jack the Ripper whenever we please? That's not it. Wow, I thought, got a lot of files named Jack the Ripper. Boys, we're gonna go through all of them. <laughs> if we actually uh, set this up to do another Jack the Ripper episode, we're not talking about Idaho at all. Surprise! <laughs> no, this is Boise, Idaho, forty-seven hundred <laughs> miles away from the Jack the Ripper killings. We're gonna talk what about killings? Jack. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> Have fun cleaning this up. <laughs> absolute maniac but so it's uh just it's an interesting fact that uh idaho happens to lead the country for female incarceration and one of the reasons i think that's interesting is because it's almost like they're overcompensating for all the years that they just didn't want to send women to prison there was like this it was almost like a taboo like nobody wanted to believe that women could commit violent crimes so it was not not only was it unusual that you would have a woman sent to prison when they were sent to prison they were sent for um basically not harsh sentences at all like if you look at this Lyda southern character who was a serial killer who killed six people four of which were husbands she got 10 years in prison for that a convicted serial killer sent to prison for 10 years 10 years is wild for i mean for a single murder never mind four I know six, four of them were husbands. And then she killed a, I think it was a brother-in-law and then she, possibly her two-year-old daughter. Oh, so that's awful. The, the, what's even weirder is they sent her for, to, ten, to prison for 10 years. She served 10 years. And then right before apparently she was supposed to be let out, she escaped. I was like, just wait a minute. <laughs> so, sometimes you just have to, you just have to go. Right. Yeah. Like sometimes you just like, like you just get fed up. It's like I've been here nine and a half years, but there's an open door, so I am just going to leave. Yeah, um, I do wonder if it was a situation where she was serving ten years to life, and after ten years, she was going to be up for parole. And then I just maybe either I missed the part or the part the article wasn't included where maybe she went up for parole and was denied, so then she escaped. But I'm just speculating because it just yeah, makes no sense to serve your ten years and then escape before they let you out. Yeah, or maybe it was a situation where she didn't think that she would ever get released there was a few prison breaks i was looking into them um and basically they they had people out doing doing work in the yard and they had this was they used like the ball and chain so they all had like the actual like ball and chain to their ankle and everything and at one point one of them you know one guy was like i, I want to go inside and get a drink and he went inside and there was one guy working in the kitchen or something like that. And apparently he had got his hands on a set of keys. So he used the keys, undid his uh, his ball and chain, and then opened a window and hopped out and ran to freedom. And the guy that was like mopping up in the kitchen just looked over. He's like, awesome. And he just went and grabbed the keys, unlocked his, and also escaped. <laughs> and one of them, I believe it was 
uh, I believe it was the guy that initially escaped. They never found him. He just straight up made it to freedom. The guy from the kitchen, they tracked him down and shot him and killed him. So he's oh. one of the 50 something that got buried there. Mm. Mm. Yeah. There's apparently a big unmarked mass grave on the site, which I don't know. That sounds like recipe for all sorts of hauntings. Uh, I want to comment on this comment from live chat. La- uh, Lonnie says that she is in a cemetery in twin falls, 120 miles from Idaho. I'm sorry, from, from Boise. So, this is why a lot of people believe that the female apparition on in the prison is not her. They think it's another inmate named Cora, but people believe that it is her. And we've talked about this on the podcast in the past that we don't believe that a ghost that you have to die in a location for your ghost to haunt that location. I think that if you have a person who's haunting that location, it's likely it's more likely if they died there. But if you spent a large portion of time there, and in a place where you're going to expend a large amount of energy, negative energy, particularly in a prison, then you can have your residual energy energy return to haunt mm. after you die there. So I think that that is not, I wouldn't call that one debunked, but uh, it no, is. No, I agree. Just, even though, yeah, even though she, it, we're talking about the woman serial killer here, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, even though she didn't die there or get buried there, that doesn't necessarily mean she can't haunt there. Right. I, I'm just going to say it. We've never said this on the show before, but we don't make the rules. That's right. We don't so. make the rules. I I don't know why I got irrationally scared for whatever was about to come out of your mouth right there, but I was. You thought I was going to be like, a, you I didn't see it was be a potato away. joke. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it's like, where are we going with this, Jesse? Um, no, I, I, again, we've talked about it. Like you said, the amount of time they spent there, the the energy that they left behind the, all of that shit. Like we keep going over this. I just think that people get too fixated on that. Sometimes it's like, well, she's buried here. So she's only going to haunt here. It's like, bro, come on. We've, we've seen people haunt multiple places, not even just one place. So. Right. Exactly. So that's my thoughts on that particular haunting, but yeah, I don't know. Killing four, four husbands in that short uh, period of time. For word not like for word not to get around to number one, and if you meet a person and you know them for long enough to marry them, you know that they're on their fourth marriage, and that all of those husbands have died. No, you don't. Not back then. I guarantee she was able to get away with it a lot easier back then. Well, I didn't. I'm not saying that you necessarily know that she, she killed them, but you know that she had four previous husbands, most likely, right? I, I doubt it. I bet she was able to cover it up pretty well. Like cover, I bet, cover up the fact that she was married to them at all. Yeah, I guarantee that she didn't have to say. She, maybe she said she had one, and he died of like natural co- or like some sort of freak accident or something. I would assume that most of her husbands didn't know about most of the other ones. Yeah, that's fair. I just I can't I just can't imagine like nowadays, like be, trying to date somebody and just concealing the fact that you've had four past spouses that have all died. It'd be a lot well, harder been, to do that. You've nowadays. been married for fifty years, so you, you don't you don't know what it's like out in the in the dating scene. No, that's in, true. In fairness, it seemed like she was marrying to kill them and probably collect some sort of money. And it's it's exactly like the case allegedly that we covered uh, with Ron Meshbesher, and hmm. you know this was a like a serial killer basically allegedly who who continued to kill off husbands for financial gain and because it seems like she really liked poisoning people i don't know what the method of killing was with this serial killer what was her method of killing poisoning it was she would boil fly paper to get the arsenic out of it and then use that to poison their food delicious it is but it's like the it's the common path of a black widow serial killer is poison they Mm -hmm. usually do it that way because it's they find a way to do it where they're it's tough to figure out that they're doing that and right just especially like back a health in, issue especially back yeah. in that time period where it's harder for an autopsy to pick up poison in somebody's system after the fact that they died so it's hard there's that but it nowadays it takes me back to the original point of i don't think she's telling them that she's had any husbands at all. Maybe she's like, yeah, I had one, but he died a long time ago. It's not like they're going to find these records on her at this time, but it seems more like she was, she was marrying two kills. So of course she's going to conceal that information. She's not going to be like, yeah, I mean, I've murdered my last three, but you're the one. Yeah. You know, so. <laughs> right. True. It's also sort of like, so she's killing for financial gain. That is actually why she was doing it. She was collecting on insurance, but serial killers 
killing for financial gain is also one of the it's the mo of hh H. holmes who was jack the ripper so he was who <laughs> Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper. We've lost a little, bit of the, a little bit of the pizzazz that we used to have. Not as much enthusiasm, mm. but well, I we'll thought you were. Back. Well, I was confused because I thought Dave was going to say that she was actually H. H. Holmes. <laughs> that, is, that is exactly <laughs> where I was going. She was H. H. Holmes, and H. H. Holmes was, in fact, Jack the Ripper. Uh, but that's all nonsense. You heard it here first. Um. So the other haunting that we covered here was. Harry Orchard, and this guy was a, a contract killer for the Western Federation of Miners Union, and he was not a subtle assassin. This guy's weapon of choice, or method of killing of choice? Fireworks. Fucking dynamite. <laughs> oh, close <laughs> enough. <laughs> yeah, dynamite. This guy was going around blowing up non-union members, which is, I think, the craziest detail. Like, what this man is what do they do? serious <laughs> about the union. I know. Seriously, you get the uh, when the union guys go on strike, they might uh, try and intimidate the other. They call them scabs, who basically patch in and work their old jobs while the yeah, company trucks keep going. They'll like, you know, they'll follow the trucks around in their car to try and intimidate them. But this guy was straight up blowing people up with dynamite, which is so brazen. And he killed, I think, seventeen people, which is an awful long stretch for. A method of killing so extreme and loud that is yeah it's the dynamite killer but it seems like he was also like rigging bombs too so it wasn't just like you know he lights it and then he's seen running away from a giant explosion it's also you know he rigged that guy's gate with the dynamite and seemed like it was more of like a yeah no i'm not i wasn't he's not he wasn't just wily coyote he was a, right. he was like actually like a bomb maker and dynamite was the explosive and then i'm sure he had different methods of activating it or triggering it so i i will say that i was a little concerned when you brought up that we had a story about a miner with a hairy orchard didn't know where it was gonna go i'm glad it ended in dynamite death as opposed to other things so kudos to you add add that to the list of things i need to edit out of this episode uh, moving <laughs> on <laughs> so he goes to jail and he ends up in the Idaho State Prison. And he served there longer than anybody else had ever served there before, almost 50 years. And he was one of these guys who got institutionalized and ended up enjoying his time there. He was doing gardening and stuff. And by the time that he was up for parole, he went up and, or he didn't go up. He volunteered, he opted out of paroling out because he was just cool with where he was at and mm. ended up when he did die. His ghost is probably the most commonly seen there, and it's just a friendly spirit surrounded by friendly energy and makes people happy, which is I can, a, a real curveball, a real twist in the story. Yeah, <laughs> kind of, but I mean, he was there for so long. He was one of those guys that kind of turned to God and became, you know, one of those inmates, and it seemed like he turned, you know, he had at least, you know, repented or, or asked for forgiveness or something like that. But it seems like by the end, he was he was pretty much a nice guy. He's obviously very institutionalized. You said he was a model citizen, which was surprising because he wasn't that good looking. Model but, inmate. Oh, I, can, I gotcha. I yeah, edit that we got a, we a whole, bunch, a whole <laughs> bunch of zingers in this episode, folks. <laughs> this episode is going to be 35 minutes long by the time Jesse's done episoding it. <laughs> episoding it, editing it. I'll be doing a lot of episoding tonight, that's for sure. <laughs> So as we yeah. continue episoding, um, no, it doesn't surprise me that he's a friendly spirit because it seems like that's kind of how he ended up, which is an interesting turn. <laughs> it is. It was a slow turn, but it eventually got there to him probably being a nice guy by the time he, um, by the time he died. Exactly. So he's there, and then the other major haunt that is at this location is the ghost of Raymond Allen Snowden, Idaho's Jack the Ripper. So Not this nice guy. guy not a nice guy. No, he is a, a ridiculous person and very violent. And it's it. people question why they, he earned the nickname Jack the Ripper because Jack the Ripper killed five people and this guy only killed one. And it wasn't quite in the fashion that Jack the Ripper killed people, but I can see how they were able to get from one to the other. You know, he... Well, uh, the, the one killing was was that brutal and and obviously the mutilation and the stabbing and everything that will uh that will make it but but for me it's like like if i'm coining 
that phrase after a killer, it's got to be a serial killer, right? Right. He did claim to have killed two other women. I, I was going to say, like, just by the nature of the way he killed her, it feels like this probably wasn't his first. Yeah, it just doesn't seem like a like with the severing of the spine, the, the intentional. Yeah. It was said after the fact, after the autopsy by the medical examiner, that that was an intentional, calculated maneuver. Was that severing of the spine? And he said he would be like how precise that it was. He would be surprised if it was somebody who was just it was just their first time so they weren't actually able to convict him of any other ones and he he wasn't even accused of any other ones other than the uh the ones he accused himself of right before he died but uh he died he didn't die well which is good he had the botched hanging right so it seemed like like he wasn't like a complete psychopath like they had asked him you know do you um feel that you should be forgiven He's, he's straight up like, no, I don't think anyone should be forgiven for what I've done. What I've done is unforgivable. And then they even asked him further. They said, when you get to heaven, do you think God will forgive you? He's like, there's no shot that God will forgive me. And, you know, I'll, I'll be in hell or whatever. So he knew he knew what he did was wrong. He wasn't one of those killers that pretended that, you know, he's all high and mighty. And, and you know, you get you get that from some. It's like that they clearly don't care. They don't recognize the magnitude of the crime that they committed. But he just straight up was like, yeah, I know. I know I'm a piece of shit. White bathing suit, slick back hair. No stopping him. Right. So that speculated that his botched uh, hanging was, was not an accident, that it was the guards rigged it that way on purpose. And it was either the rope was too long or not long enough and didn't break his neck. He just basically hung there and strangled to death in front of the family for 15 minutes. So they used to do stuff like that all the time. All the, the botched executions yeah, people yeah. who were accused of particularly not accused, but convicted of particularly gruesome things. So it doesn't shock yeah. me for our audio listeners that botched is in air quotes. It's they botched it. Wink, wink. Yeah. Uh, you know, right. everything was most likely done on purpose, most likely done on purpose. I would think that if I were to work in the prison system, I would probably do the same for certain killers. Like certain ones, it's like the justice system just doesn't even do it justice, even though they're about to die. Like for like child killers and other kind of criminals in that, you know, in that range, they should they should have a thing where it's like, all right, family's going to come in. They're all going to punch you in the face at least once. You know, it's like like the families, ah, they deserve that. And now that it's this quote unquote painless death now with lethal injection and everything, it's just it doesn't seem like enough. Yeah, they should have what they should have done is they should have made them dress up like a circus clown or something and give a performance before they executed them and just made everyone boo them as they gave this awful um, performance. Yeah, or make them attempt stand up comedy and just yeah. no, one, no one's gonna laugh. <laughs> No one's yeah. it, although that that could backfire what if they're hilarious then you're like great now everyone loves this guy well they're gonna have a finale that no one forgets at that point so i mean it's a win-win situation could have an oubliette yeah they could tried the stand-up oubliette. comedy thing with harry orchard but he bombed <laughs> it's a thing. anyways next week on episode 94 <laughs> of hometown ghost stories we're going to try again um, <laughs> Yeah, but uh, Raymond. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was going to move on. So if you had a thought, I was just going to continue. But there's no way it was going to get any any worse than it already was. So you just keep going. We're, <laughs> right. we're failing miserably. So Raymond Allen is Raymond Allen Snowden is the is the meanest of all the ghosts there, and his his haunting is pretty creepy. So when you encounter his ghost, which is in the cell block house five which was the ex- where the execution chamber was. It's where death row is. If you're walking through there, you'll actually hear the sound of somebody choking and gasping, but nobody will be there. And that is thought to be the ghost of Raymond Snowden, which adds up. It does. And it's not something that I would particularly be too excited to experience, or maybe I would being a ghost hunter. I think that that would be a pretty cool haunting. <laughs> to see so right but it does it does sound terrifying and uh yeah who knows i believe it i mean it, it, it could be and then so that could be something residual and it's just the, the last sounds he made i mean is that coming from I'm, i forgive me is it coming from outside a cell or is it coming from the execution chamber it's just you can hear it 
in cell block five. So that whole building, you'll you'll hear, experience that haunting in different places. Interesting. Right. That's interesting. People have heard it coming from the inside the cells and they've heard it inside the execution chamber. And there was that one story that I opened up with was a story from actually one of the uh, docents there, the tour guides, that she was giving a tour one day and she was standing on the trap door. And while she was talking to the crowd about Raymond Snowden, the door to the stairway slammed and all the lights simultaneously went out in the whole building, which is crazy. Huh. That is actually really interesting. Really wild. My first instinct would be, is there faulty wiring? And did you slam the door so hard that it just shut off the lights? Oh, kind of like every time you stomp the floor and your light changes light behind you. Change. <laughs> exactly. So, so, so I would definitely, point. I'm assuming that that door has been slammed lots of times and they would have picked up on the pattern by now. Right. I agree. And that's a so good point. I'll, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. I do want to mention uh, Matthew T who donated $6.67 to one up Demon King by one cent. Thank you so much for the donation. I don't think we mentioned it earlier. We pulled it up on the screen, but thank you again, Matty. You're always a absolute legend. Yes, indeed. Do you, do you guys think that when they're sentencing these criminals and they're giving them life in prison, maybe they should also give them afterlife in prison? So like you're sentenced to seven life sentences and also the afterlife, just to really needle them a little bit more to make them think about things that they're going to be stuck there forever. It feels like something they should do. Nope. I don't think they do that. I didn't say they do. You didn't say they do. You said they should. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Listen with your bad bomb jokes. My bomb joke was great. It was the opposite of a bomb joke because it didn't bomb. But so those are three hauntings. <laughs> We're going to move on. We're just going to move on. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we make it to episode 100. We, we, we were promoting it. But I mean, at this rate, I don't know. So those are the three major hauntings of this prison, but they're not the only hauntings. There are several other areas in this prison complex that are also haunted. One of them is the solitary confinement building. This building consisted of two different sections. The first was built in the early 1920s. And although it was built for solitary confinement, each cell contained four to six men, which sounds like not solitary confinement. That's the opposite. That is the opposite. That is not. (laughs) So I'm guessing it's got to be a bad time, though. You know, you got to think in most cells, uh, you're you have one, you know, one cellmate, if you will. Solitary, you're dealing with a much smaller cell and you're dealing with, you know, four people. That sounds like a terrible time. Sounds like a terrible time for one person. So you can only imagine the fistfights and fighting for limited space that would happen inside those. It actually sounds like a worse time. Yeah. If I'm going to solitary, I want to be alone. Let me go crazy by myself. I don't want to be crazy or cramped in a room with three other dudes. You promised me solitary. But these uh, cells were very small. So the second section was nicknamed Siberia because of how absolutely cold it was in there. And it was built in 1926 and housed 12 three-foot by eight-foot cells. For anybody listening in Europe that uses the metric system, that's less than a meter wide and less than three meters deep, which is crazy especially this these ones they were not packing three or four people in these ones you are solitary but that is so incredibly small um i I don't i don't know how they dealt with that but it was one inmate per cell in siberia and the hauntings there are and this is weird the hauntings there are cold spots so you can find cold spots in the cells that they nicknamed siberia for being incredibly cold i don't know if that one checks out for me but uh, it says at least one spirit was stuck in his cell eternally. So one of the cells in Siberia are haunted by one of the former inmates. Makes sense. I mean, you really got to assume that a cold spot would be something that you would experience in the place that was named after the cold spots. But maybe it's something that just doesn't add up. You, you Also, you'd think that like in the winter at that time, that place is going to be cold as all hell anyways. That's why I got the nickname. It probably mm-hmm. wasn't nicknamed that off of random cold spots. So you got to think if, if there's a set temperature, a baseline temperature, and then all of a sudden, you know, temp drops that in every other location, that is a sign of the paranormal. So I wouldn't dismiss it off the bat just because it's known for being cold. True. That's a good point. That's a good point. It's just something that caught me off guard a little bit. So another haunted location on this 
premises is the Rose Garden. Many spirits still find the Rose Garden a place of peace and respite. Some have fond memories of taking care of the plants or enjoy the beautiful flowers that still bloom there. A male spirit dressed in prison issue gardening clothes has been seen by visitors taking care of the plants. He resembles a living person thought to be Harry Orchard since he spent a lot of his time gardening in this very area. So that's kind of next haunting. But what happens is somebody will appear to be gardening there and then they will disappear. So pretty obviously a ghost. Yeah, I'd say so. And this is actually thanks, all. Thanks for that added commentary, Jesse. That's Just... literally what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd say it's a ghost. Sounds like one. So the Rose Garden was actually the place where the portable gallows were set up in the earlier years. They didn't have the execution chamber with the fancy trap door. So anytime there was an execution to be had there, they're just basically roll in this, this uh, portable set of gallows and they would do the executions and they pack it up and put it away. So the apparitions that are seen here are spirits that are attached to this place of death and people will catch apparitions of hanging corpses, which is terrifying. I wish they outsourced that. Like, I wish that you could have a job back then where you were the portable gallows guy, where mm. they just called you like, hey, we have three executions next Friday. Can we yeah. book you from 7 to 11? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, I'm sorry. The weekends are reserved for the Lobata mobile. He's, he's, he's only making his way around. The Gallo mobile will be there shortly after. So like, sure, for an cool. extra hundred dollars, I'll bring my DJ with me and we'll just make this a whole thing. We'll do that. Be live music, entertainment <laughs> and lobotomies. If you, you know, you could do lobotomies too. It's going to be a whole festival. <laughs> Would have made a pretty cool Western movie back in the day. Like a freelance executioner just rolling through town with his portable gallows attached oh, yeah. to his wagon. That sounds that like something cool. that could have been in. Um, you guys ever watched the Ballad of Buster Scruggs? Yes. Yeah, it feels like that could have been one of the one of the short episodes in that. Would have been fine with it. So uh, these ghosts, they like to harass paranormal investigators around three o'clock in the morning when they apparently have control of this area. And also moving cold spots are felt when it's hot outside and there is no wind. So cold I, spots. I want some ghosts that produce cold spots to haunt my house in the summer, I think, mm. because... I need it occasionally. Yeah, I could use one right now. It's like a thousand Same. degrees. <laughs> <It's on. laughs> I can't. I can't open my window because if I open my window, you guys will hear all my screaming crickets that apparently <laughs> reside directly outside my window, and that's pretty unpleasant for the ears. Yes. So we kind of mentioned it already. Cell Cell House Block Five is one of the most haunted places in the prison, and it's haunted because of the spirit of Raymond Snowden. There are other full-bodied apparitions that have been seen here reliving their incarceration. One of them I didn't cover, but I briefly mentioned in the opening story, the spirit of inmate Douglas Van Vlack, who suicided. He makes his presence known by causing batteries to go dead. He has been seen as a greenish light. This guy might have been worse than the actual Idaho Jack the Ripper. His crime was pretty gruesome. If we want, we can get into that real quick if I can... Do tell. All right. So Douglas Van Vlack, this is from magicvalley.com. The 20-year-old Mildred Hook's new husband, husband, Douglas Van Vlack, age 29, was politely described as a misanthrope, and Hook knew her parents would not approve of their union. Their rocky marriage ended two years later after many months of Van Vlack's unemployment, heavy drinking, and spousal abuse. Van Vlack stalked his ex-wife for two months, and in November 1935, abducted her at gunpoint, forcing her into his slate gray 1931 Ford Model A coupe. Tacoma police sent out an alert across the West. On November 24th, 1935, the two stayed in Boise, then left the next morning for Salt Lake City. That afternoon, State Patrolman Frontline, excuse me, State Patrolman Fontaine Cooper and Twin Falls Sheriff's Deputy Henry Givens saw Van Vlack's eastbound coupe on Highway 30. Cooper, 34, of Lava Hot Springs, pulled over in the car, excuse me, he pulled over the car and the officers approached the driver. When confronted, Van Vlack shot Cooper in the left eye, killing him instantly. Van Vlack then shot Givens three times. Eyewitness Cliff Hammond, a farmer, watched in his rearview mirror while Where Van that Vlack- is called an eyewitness when the guy's eye got shot out? Uh, his eye was not like shot liter- out. <laughs> no, but, but literally, he was literally an eyewitness? 
Yes, he was an eyewitness of the eye shooting. The other guy was not an eyes witness. He was just... No. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was dead, so he made a terrible witness. He watched in his rearview mirror while Van Vlack, with his ex-wife in tow, left the scene in his car. Hammond returned the truck to returned in his truck to find the man dead and the other one critically wounded. He took the wounded officer to a nearby hospital. On the morning of November 25th, the sheriff's posse found Van Vlack alone, trying to stay warm in a bar, a borrow pit. I don't know what that is. A journalist named Carl Groth disarmed the fugitive and held him at gunpoint until the uh, police arrived. Hook's body, which is the wife, was later found stuffed in a culvert hidden by sagebrush. Givens later died of his wounds. A Twin Falls jury convicted Van Vlack of Hook's murder and sentenced him to die by hanging. Five hours before he was to hang on December 9th, 1937, Van Vlack slipped out of his cell and shimmied 32 feet up onto a beam in the Idaho State Pen Penitentiary. He said, quote, I have the right to choose the way I die. Boise Capital News quoted Van Vlack as saying before he nosedived onto the concrete floor. He did, not, he did not die immediately. And Warden William H. Guess still contemplated hanging him since oh, he wasn't so dead. Sure I was so like, that sure would have been such a crazy ending to the story if they were just like, he's not dead. Should we just hang him anyways? And they did. They ended up not doing that. And that uh, warden ended up getting fired for incompetence. Not because he didn't hang the dead guy, but because, but he, because he let him Spider-Man yeah. his way up to the ceiling. Exactly. Yeah, I get that. But this goes back to bad people deserve terrible deaths, and that was one of them. And now I think they really should have just taken everybody up to that same beam, all the really bad killers, and just tossed them off that thing. Like, ha-ha, now hang them. Mm -hmm. Should have been the policy. Blew the opportunity there. Now your place is haunted. See what happens. Complete. Complete. They should have just made them do it again. Like, <laughs> try again. Again. <laughs> do it again. <laughs> exactly. So uh, another haunted location in this area, or not in this area, but in this prison is the multi-purpose building. So unseen spirits go about their business here, perhaps reliving their good times or jobs. And on a darker note, trigger warning, the spirit of a man who was brutally raped and killed here in the shower room during the August 1971 riot still makes his presence known in benign ways. Who showers during a riot? It was, I don't know if he was shot. No, maybe they just took him to the room. All right, fine. That's where they happen to be rioting in that room. But yeah, just there's a riot going on, so you just take out a shower. I don't I don't think so. <laughs> I could take as long and as hot of a shower as I want now. No rules. <laughs> Poor guy. That's tough. That is tough. Residual energy also replays his repeated attack and multiple stabbings by a group no. of angry men. That is a tough one to replay. That's, that's a rough one. Not and good. The, the spirits of these angry men may also be stuck here as well, which makes sense if they're part of that residual replay mm -hmm. it does yeah that's rough that's a rough story to go back to the uh the the guy who climbed up and then jumped off the pipe or whatever i thought that you were gonna say that this was an escape attempt and he's just clinging upside down like spider pig or something like that and he's like and now <laughs> you don't dictate when i die and then just scurries his way out on, on the pipe i was like <laughs> what a weird way like that's a bad way to break out of prison is like talking shit on your way out <laughs> like, i know Aha, fuckers, I'm leaving. Like, okay, get that guy. No, it's yeah. legendary if you actually pull it off, though. It would be. It would be. True. He technically did pull it off. It wasn't an immediate death. It was probably super agonizing. But I, I think he was unconscious, which made yeah. the whole hanging him thing more interesting. If they're just <laughs> hanging so, unconscious should have done guy. Should have done it. What's the deal? Oh, well, now he's dead. What do we do? You know, this was supposed to happen. If anything, it'd be more humane, right? Put him out of his misery. They let him just... Basically. Maybe that maybe that's why why they chose not to. Maybe they're like you know what? Let's let this fucker suffer for a while. Maybe. Yeah. Cell House Block Four is the next spot here that is haunted. The spirit of a suicide is still serving time here. Other spirits keep him company, serving time too. Stuck here, quote for some reason. I believe a lot of this comes from a lot of psychic mediums will come to this prison for tours and they will go through that's where the story of harry orchard being a, a tour guide came from it came from a psychic medium who said that his spirit was with her the whole time telling her all about the place and a lot of what he said checked out take it with a great assault because everything that she said was also public information so benefit of the doubt it is possible so very interesting cell house block two is uh the next area that's haunted 
The spirit of a large burly man, a quote, big Louie type on steroids, is not afraid of anyone living or dead. He is known to shove staff and visitors in the back for fun, and he especially likes to bother mediums. So the ghost of Big Louie. That's exciting. Always exciting to run into a Big Louie. Yes. Yep. Bullies the staff and the visitors. And three spirits who killed themselves are still here serving time. Doing the deed may have gotten them peace at first, but they find themselves still stuck here. There is residual energy from the prison riots also that can be felt when you're here. This is all from, I should mention, from hauntedhouses.com, all this information. Yeah, so they got the graveyard out back. They have lots of deaths that happened here from sickness, from, uh, you know, all, all sorts of executions, obviously, old age, th- those kinds of things. I didn't really see much on, like, prisoner on prisoner murders. Now, you just mentioned one that happened during the riot. Outside of the riots, did you find a lot of cases of prisoners killing prisoners? No, I didn't see a lot of records of it. There was a lot of guard on prisoner violence, none specific that I found record of. But the reason for the riots was the prisoners were were getting sick of the ridiculous abuse that they were taking from the prison guards. So I feel like there was probably more guard on prisoner violence. But I'm sure that there was plenty of prisoner on prisoner violence being a prison. Right. I mean, that's usually when you think of prison deaths, you usually think that it's mostly prisoner on prisoner that that's what i usually think of anyways when i think of you know prisoners dying but yeah as you go back further in time i think there was oh, more, that's what more, I was more say. guards yeah. killing prisoners but you got to assume that the you know murders were happening inside there as well yeah i assume there were i just didn't find anything particularly on it and the unpaid museum docents as the this isn't an area technically they they roam all over so there's a female spirit cora and the male spirit, lifer Harry Orchard, are both enthusiastic about being in a museum exhibit. They volunteer to be unpaid docents, gladly showing mediums and other psychic folks around their prison home. I mentioned this earlier. Apparently, Cora is the welcoming committee at the front gate and was the spectral docent for the women's prison. And Harry popped in and out, telling the medium, Jennifer, about each area that the investigation visited. So... Those are two definitely friendly spirits, and there are obviously a whole bunch of non-friendly spirits. But this prison is so incredibly haunted, as has been testified by a lot of the people, paranormal investigators and basically paranormal enthusiasts, and people who aren't even into the paranormal have gone there and experienced things. So if you're in the Idaho area and want a spooky experience, swing by and do the tour. They still do tours there. They do. Yeah. And we mentioned it earlier. They are open to paranormal investigations. So any location that does open themselves up to paranormal investigations, obviously you're going to get a a massive spike in evidence that's found. And this is one of those locations so that the evidence is just, you know, bottomless. It's just endless. There's so many people that have experienced hauntings here. It's hard to refute that this place is not uh, one of the more haunted places in the country. So put it on the list. Put it on the list. Short list. Jesse's short list of 400 places he wants to go investigate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll publish a book. It'll be called Jesse's short list of haunted places. It'll be eight volumes. <laughs> 94 and counting. Yeah. <laughs> that's ever growing. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a wrap for me over here at the uh, Ohio State Penitentiary. Nope. Yeah. Nope. Not, nope. Nope. No. Not the Ohio State Penitentiary. Did I say Ohio? Chat's been, chat did it. They've been saying Ohio this whole time. <laughs> Threw me for a loop. <laughs> Idaho. I you know what? I, old Idaho, which kind of sounds like Ohio. I think that's what threw me off. The old Idaho yep. State, the old Idaho State Penitentiary. <laughs> <laughs> nice yes. try though. You almost nailed it. You almost, almost did a good job it. on an episode. Then you blew it. Almost. Blew it at the end. I just, I just joined in with Rob on the nopes. I had no idea what we were denouncing. <laughs> I, like, I thought you were going to add something. I'm like, what'd you find? How exciting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I, th- I think you covered every square inch of that, of that prison. So kudos to you for yeah. finding that. Absolutely. Got to be right, thorough. Do, do we want to get into our five-star review? We do. Absolutely. All right. I'm going to read this review and then I'm going to tell you some things about it. So this is from Knuckle Bones. So Knuckle Bones, I hope you are listening to this episode. Uh, hopefully Dave and Jesse's bad jokes didn't get you to leave. It is titled, Love This Show. 
The stories are great, and the banter between the guys leaves me laughing. Do you guys want to know how many stars this was? Oh, yes. <laughs> this was stars? a two-star review. <laughs> and I'm reading it so that the so that this can be corrected, Knucklebones. I think you meant to give us a five-star review. You gave us a two-star review, so just go press that five-star button if you don't mind. <laughs> we don't normally let our non five star reviews slip through the cracks, but this is, this is, we're reaching out to you because we do think <laughs> that you genuinely meant for this to be five star. I think that all of the reviews that aren't five star, they actually meant for it to be a five star. we got another one that was yeah. kind of like, like lo love the show, but you got one thing wrong. So here's a one star review. Like, <laughs> why are you like this? Like you love the show. <laughs> Jump in and chat and like mention, you know, whatever. Anyways, you can't win them all, but yeah, please, please go fix that one. So <laughs> any other uh, five star reviews? No, that, that was the one for this week. Um, I just wanted to read that. And while you're reading the Patreon list, I'm going to see if we got enough likes on the video to reveal where our next investigation is going to be. Mm -hmm. According to Ricardo, before he took off, he said that we did get there, I believe. So uh, our VIPs, we have Allison V, Dakota G, Jeannie R, Jennifer P, Lisa J, Mike, Urbiet, Blake, Mom and Pops W, Robert H, and Inspires Gaming. Thank you so much for being VIPs. For our Warren's Wards, we have Amby Rose, Anna C, Kath Q, Chris C, Cody G, DC, Donnie N, Elizabeth Young, Lily, Jake V, Janice G, Mar Fire, Matthew T, Papa Squatch, Rachel B, Sarah Cook, Steph A of the COTS. We have Stitch Kitten, Sydney B, the other Rachel B and that is it for the Warren's Wards. Thank you for joining that tier. And then for our Ghost Pirate Mafia, we have Al Capone. We have Al Capone's po allegedly poorly clothed folding bed. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> so that changed. Oh, you, uh, you pronounced it wrong. It's fully clothed. I'm sorry. It's, you're right. Al Capone's <laughs> allegedly poorly clothed folding bed. That's a tough one to say. We have Al Capone's allegedly pork poorly. This sucks. Doing this. <laughs> I'm so glad you guys are patrons, but this is so challenging every single time. Al Capone's allegedly poorly taxidermied wife, Alicia Espinoza, Anthony character limits be damned T, Ashley M, Brandon W, Brennan, here's a cake, piss on it. What is that, Brendan? What do we, <laughs> Brennan, what does that mean? <laughs> I think that's Captain a throwback Mc... reference to a, an older episode. It must be. One. There's got to be something there, right? Then we have Captain McSlugs, Colby, 020 Fire, Crystal Quinn, Hooska, Castle, Huggy Bear, Joe R, Kira Lee, J, Michaela T, Mina H, Mariah M, Murder Cow. We have a murder cow. <laughs> murder cow. <laughs> this, li this list. So thank, thank God I only look at this so many times a week, but this it never <laughs> ceases to absolutely surprise me. We have Nick. We have Nuthouse Queen. Uh, we have Paul from St. Louis. We still have Pork. We have Sam from Nepal, pork. Sarah R, Scotty L, Solar Flare, and the Big Spag Nasty. Thank you guys so much for being members on Patreon. As much as I pretend to hate this, I do love you guys, and thank you so much. You guys uh, keep it going. Uh, as little as three dollars a month, you can get on Patreon. You can get early access to episodes. We have ad-free episodes. We have an RSS feed if that is something that you know how to finagle. And a um, bunch of bonus content is going to be dropping in October as it is spooky season, ladies and gentlemen. Get your hoodies, get your shirts. They are available on, at hometownghoststories.com. And once again, October 20th, we have our episode 100 celebration party. It'll be in Plymouth, Massachusetts, Second Wind Brewing. Make sure you swing by. Yes. One more housekeeping note. We are moving all of our reviews over to its own YouTube channel. So look for HTGS Reviews and go subscribe to that channel. All of the reviews that we post, the movie reviews, will still be on the regular podcast feeds, though. Oh, so Brendan was talking about the witch cakes from the Salem episode. I do uh, conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Completely went over my head at first, but we, but we got there. Anyways, we're we're, we're at one hundred and eighty thousand episodes, and we're not going to remember every little thing. But when it gets brought up, I do remember the talks. Sometimes. Absolutely. All right. Stick around after the credits, and Rob will reveal. For YouTube listeners. Wow. All I right. Guess we, I guess we hate our podcast listeners. Yes, we do. <laughs> 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 Stick around after this video for the uh for the reveal. <laughs> do it now. Yeah. Podcast listeners, thank all the YouTube listeners for achieving the correct amount of likes. We Dave, you have thrown I don't know what listeners. to do now. I don't know what to do with my hands right now because am I supposed to say it? Am I not supposed to say it? Jack the, the Ripper! Ripper! 
So how do you guys want to end the show? (laughs) (laughs) Do whatever you want. Peace. What another terrifying episode of Hometown Ghost Stories. I, for one, have goosebumps. Can you see them through the tattoos? Probably not. That's okay. What I need you to do is press that like, that subscribe button, then notify it so that you know when we go live. Sometimes there's secret live shows. That way you can jump in, join the chat. We do these video game streams that I've absolutely never died on. Not once. It's never happened. So if you want to see that, make sure you're notified. You can also get some merch. Go to hometownghoststories.com. Join the Discord. I've pitched everything that we have here. Please help the show out any way that you can, and we will catch you next time here at Hometown Ghost Stories.